it's uh, still interesting. So I start off with a short introduction of the company I work for. Uh, so we are a, a spin-off of the University of Ghent uh, from 1988 uh, as a commercialization of the uh, Dranko technology, which is, which is a dry anaerobic digestion uh, process. Uh, since then, uh, we've grown from, from a few people to 70 employees. Uh, and we are still located uh, in Ghent and Belgium, but we also have some affiliates in uh, the USA, in Germany, and a partner in Japan. Um, so the, this is our company uh, structure. So we have two major divisions, which is the, the Dranko Tech uh, technology, which is still responsible for uh, building anaerobic digestion plants, uh, among which the uh, composting and AD plant here in Vitoria. Um, and uh, second uh, large uh, division is the lab uh, division, uh, which is uh, subdivised in a, a BCE, which is uh, mostly active in uh, tests on biodegradability of, um, uh, amongst others, bioplastics. Um, we're also doing some work uh, on the plastics in, in TransBio. Uh, BCS, uh, which is a supporting uh, division for our Drancotech uh, technology, uh, but which also provides uh, consulting for any anaerobic digestion technology. Uh, ACS is on uh, waste management uh, in a more general uh, aspect. And SAS is uh, active in performing life cycle uh, analysis on different uh, technologies and processes. Uh, so we have more than 25 years of experience uh, in all different uh, AD uh, processes and uh, technologies. Uh, and we have uh, a unique combination of both mechanical uh, and uh, technical and biological uh, knowledge. Uh, and we give independent advice and guidance at each level of anaerobic digestion, um, which is, is in, in theory, it's, it's a feasibility testing for new projects um, covering the whole um, process chain from post-treatment to anaerobic digestion to uh, post-treatment of, um, of the digest state. Um, and these tests yield all necessary information to uh, scale up to a full-scale uh, project. Uh, besides from that, we also provide continuous uh, assistance for full-scale plant going from startup to revamping to optimizing the process to uh, just maintaining a stable process. Um, so this is a picture of the uh, composting plant in Vitoria that we built in, I think, 2006. Uh, but most of you probably know it uh, from the real-life version. Um, so organic waste, uh, what options are there? Um, just, okay, this is not a full... Uh, review of uh, technologies that are available, but just the major ones that have been um, put in practice in the past and, and in the future. So first of all, landfill, uh, the oldest one and, and, and the most cheapest uh, one, of course, but also the uh, least sustainable option. There is no recuperation of, of materials, of nutrients. Um, in cases, in some cases, there is recuperation of energy as landfill gas, but it's it's has a low efficiency because the, the, uh, the conditions are, are very suboptimal. Um, and there are also a lot of leakage, leakages of uh, methane into the atmosphere. Um, and therefore, it's, it's becoming discouraged in, in many countries, be it as a, a landfill ban or by imposing uh, high taxes for, for organic uh, waste uh, sent to landfill. Um, secondly, you have incineration. Um, there you can have a limited recuperation of materials, for example, metals that are recovered from uh, municipal solid waste. Uh, but still, there is no recuperation of nutrients. Uh, usually, the ashes are landfilled, and even if they would uh, be available for recycling, uh, due to the incineration, the plant availability, plant availability is very low, so it's, it's, it's very useless to, to recycle them. Um, there is recuperation of energy, but in case of, of high moisture content in organic waste, it's also on a very low efficiency because of uh, water that has to be evaporated uh, during the process. Uh, thirdly, we come to composting, which is uh, becoming a lot more sustainable. Uh, this is stabiliz stabilization of the organic waste. Um, you have a recuperation of materials as soil improver and also nutrients are recycled in the compost. But still, it's an energy, energy intensive process. Uh, so you put energy in it to, to produce a compost. Um, so then fourthly comes the anaerobic digestion, uh, which has more or less all the same advantages as composting. Uh, you recover the material. You uh, you, reco you recuperate the nutrients in the digestate state or derived products, which can also be compost. Um, but here you have a recovery of energy. So anaerobic digestion yields energy. It, it does not produce. It's not a net producer of, of energy. So what is anaerobic digestion? Okay, you start with the organic uh, matter that you have. Uh, and a consortium of bacteria. It it's, can be a very broad range. Uh, it's not, not really specified. Uh, that are um, operating at two uh, 
uh, temperature areas, uh, be it around 35 degrees in mesophilic bacteria or 55 degrees in thermophilic bacteria in the absence of oxygen, which produce digestate, which is the anaerobic equivalent of compost, um, and energy in the form of biogas. Uh, it's, a combination, it's, it's a mixture of methane and carbon dioxide, which can be used as, as natural gas uh, replacement or be converted to, uh, to electricity. Okay, anaerobic digestion, it's, it's one process, but it's, it's a lot of uh, types of, of uh, processes that are available on the market. You have mesophilic, you have thermophilic, uh, wet versus dry, single stage, multiple stage. Um, there are a lot of combinations uh, of technologies uh, possible. So up till now, this was the okay, uh, basic general scheme of anaerobic digestion, coming from organic waste to compost and energy. Um, but uh, due to the transbio uh, process and... and um, yeah, a new trend that is, is to get more uh, value out of organic waste. This should be or become uh, hopefully the new uh, process scheme for anaerobic digestion in which you okay, still start from the organic waste, but before um, going to anaerobic digestion, you first have a pretreatment, go to biorefinery, produce some uh, interesting high value uh, products from it. Then you have some spent biomass, uh, which, which is or the organic waste minus um, the byproducts that were extracted which is still useful for anaerobic digestion for producing uh, biogas, which can be internally recycled to the biorefinery to make it economically and uh, energy neutral, um, and still yields a uh, compost containing all the nutrients which can be recycled uh, to the agricultural soil and, and closing the loop. Um, so this is all, uh, what we did in Transbio. So uh, as a, a lot of the uh, other partners have already uh, presented, production of enzymes, biopolymers, and platform chemicals uh, from um, vegetable waste, um, with the goal to reduce waste, maximize recycling. Uh, we, we added anaerobic digestion to this um, to, to recuperate the remaining uh, spent materials uh, from this process. Uh, so we took a two-step approach. I uh, started with a short-term, two-week anaerobic digestion test just to determine the biogas potential of these uh, different products. Uh, and from then on, we went further with a uh, continuous digestion test um, to um, simulate a full-scale uh, plant on this type of material. Uh, so first of all, we started uh, with the vegetable waste before um, extraction of bioproduct, just to have a, a reference, uh, reference situation. Uh, so we see here uh, for some, uh, a few examples of this. Um, well, conclusion from this graph is that all these products have a very good uh, potential for, bi for biogas production. High high degradability. Um, there is uh, some variation between uh, these products, but all in all, these are good products for anaerobic digestion. Um, also for um, some uh, products from Costa Rica, banana pulp uh, residue, um, a little bit more variation, but it lies in the same uh, range of the, the other vegetable waste. So all these products are suitable for anaerobic digestion. Uh, and they're good carbon to nitrogen, <coughs> nitrogen ratio, high degradability to biogas, good methane content. Um, but the big question is, will this remain the same uh, after bioproducts have been uh, extracted from these materials? Um, so we selected uh, the sweet corn and potato waste uh, to evaluate this. Um, here you see the results for the sweet corn. Um, so the, um, the blue line uh, is the sweet corn before extraction. The other ones are replicates of, of uh, product that we obtained from uh, Transbio partners after some um, bio biopolymers were extracted. So here you see there's some variation, but all in all, we get the same uh, biogas potential expressed on uh, dry matter content. Um, carbon to nitrogen ratio remain more or less the same. Also high degradability, good methane content. Um, so it seemed like even after extracting products from it, it still is an ideal feedstock uh, to use in anaerobic digestion. Um, same goes for the potato waste. Um, so here the, uh, the purple uh, graph is the untreated um, material. So after extraction, okay, there's a little decrease, but it's, it's, yeah, it's not very significant. So again, we can go to the same conclusions um, that it's still suitable for anaerobic digestion. Were it not that we measured high levels of uh, sodium and potassium in the solid fraction after uh, extraction of, of uh, bioproducts. Um, and especially uh, the potassium, uh, the, yeah, the potassium is, is known as a, a possible inhibitor um, parameter for anaerobic digestion. So 
it seems a suitable feedstock for anaerobic digestion, but this potassium um, needs further investigation. So therefore, we uh, started, um, okay, this is, again, some conclusions um, from the potato waste. So therefore, we're going to uh, the full uh, continuous anaerobic digestion test to simulate uh, the process on a, full, on a, on a continuous scale, uh, simulating what it will be on full scale. Um, evaluate it on the long term, see if there is any toxic effects or nutrient deficiency, and, and see if we can obtain a stable process uh, that can be uh, translated in a, in a real uh, plant. So this is the input. Um, okay, it's not going into detail on this. Main thing is that we do, uh, we start at a rather low uh, feeding rate just to give the bacteria the time to adapt to this new uh, type of product. Then we increase uh, this feeding rate continuously until a point that it's, it's becoming too much for the bacteria and they crash. Um, so some crash earlier than the others. So that, that gives us valuable information on how stable the process will be on a, on a high uh, loading rate. Um, what we did then is just restart it again, but instead of going to the maximum, okay, we, we, we went to a loading rate that is still high, but that we uh, believe from the first test uh, would yield, result in a stable uh, process. Um, so this is the biogas productivity, which is more or less the same graph, just uh, expressed as how much biogas can be produced uh, per kilogram reactor and per day. Uh, it, it gives you an, an idea of, of the production of, of energy that you can, can obtain. So com conclusions um, from these tests. They are still running, but we are rounding them up. So for the sweet corn, uh, after bioproduct extraction, we can uh, conclude that it yields in a stable process, both uh, mesophilic and thermophilic. Um, but there is a necessity for nitrogen and micronutrient addition because uh, this product lacks uh, this product, this, this component, um, and it would not result in a, in a stable process without adding them. But okay, these are rather low cost uh, products, there's very small concentrations that need to be added. Um, so with this addition, you get stable products, and thermophilic uh, has the highest loading rate, uh, and this, which is uh, normal if everything's go uh, going well. Um, in the potato pulp residue, we saw something different uh, for the, um, let me go back to this graph. So this is the biogas productivity um, of the uh, thermophilic potato waste uh, after bioproduct extraction. And you see after only seven weeks, you have a huge collapse uh, of, the, um, of the process. Um, whereas the mesophilic, uh, which is this one, continues to, to perform well. Uh, and we believe that this is the potassium that we already feared might have some, some negative effect um, on the process is indeed uh, becoming too toxic to get a stable pro uh, process. Um, at mesophilic conditions, we did not see this, uh, this problem. Uh, so for this type of product, mesophilic uh, is the better choice uh, of this. Um, also, the potato waste is, is richer in nitrogen, so we didn't need to add uh, nitrogen, but we did have to need, need, needed to add some micronutrients just to, to uh, optimize the uh, conditions for the bacteria. Um, and also, the combination of uh, sweet corn and potato pulp as, as co-substrates, which is the, uh, the blue curve here. Um, see, it's, it's, see that it's, it's, it's less stable um, than the... the, the, the uh, um, separate uh, production, but again, it's at uh, thermophilic conditions that we tested it. Uh, so we, have the, we know that we have some negative impact from potassium in the potato waste, but it's not, um, it's diluted enough, uh, as to say, with the sweet corn uh, product. Um, so all in all, anaerobic digestion seemed like a successful concept to treat organic residues after production uh, of these uh, high value uh, chemicals. So with that, I want to conclude. And if there are any questions, I'm here.